I hadn't slept very much that night. I get off the get off the plane, you know, kind of stumble toward the gate, grab my bag, and I head straight to a client site. And when I get there, I meet this scraggly-haired guy, and he says, "Hi, my name is Mark. Come with me." And so we go, and I find myself about an hour later standing in front of a military base that I'm not authorized to be in, trying to convince the guard to let us in. And so this is my life as a user experience designer. Just for proof that I got in, <laughs> um, these are some like armory kinds of. Uh, things and some Humvees and tanks and all kinds of stuff. So I did get in. But we live in this, we live in kind of two different worlds right now, an agile world and a user experience world. The agile world being about like continuous improvement, making our code better, refactoring, deleting a lot of our code, writing tests, right, like that kind of stuff. We also live in this user experience world, which is all about making our tasks simpler, making our interfaces more intuitive, talking to users, understanding, that kind of stuff. As developers, we like to work from a really clearly defined specification, right? But as designers, we kind of figure out what we're doing as we do it. <clears throat> so in reality, these two worlds live in conflict with each other. Um, agile development, again, taking big, big picture stuff, breaking them down into small pieces that we can manage and figure out a process around it. But when you talk to designers, you want to take these little tiny pieces that have been specced out for us, and we need to think about the bigger picture again. So when we... Um, I know Joe doesn't like this quote, but um, retrofitting the, water the waterfall UX process to Agile was doomed from the beginning. It's a shame we kept trying for as long as we did. Jared Spool, who's like, you know, runs user interface engineering, one of the big leading UX companies. So both Agile and user experience are good practices. We should do both, absolutely. But they conflict with each other. So in order for us to really do this well, what we need to do is focus on the things those two have in common, the constants. And the constant is our users, right? The way our users feel, especially. And then we need to take that constant, those users, and we need to create a culture in our team that embraces that. So the big takeaway that I want you to have from the talk today is that we need to have a culture on our team that embraces uh, empathy with users. And culture is pretty magical, right? Because if you get a bunch of people in the room that share the same values and they believe the same things and they all kind of get along and they, and they approach things the same way, you get pr productive things happening that otherwise, like, you can't manufacture, right? Like, you get these things automatically and for free because the culture is right. So when Steve Jobs says, real artists ship, what he's trying to do is create this culture, a culture that we create really great products and we ship them, the latter not being, or the former not being useful unless the latter happens, right? And the other interesting thing, interesting thing about culture is that it exists no matter where you are, whatever group you're in. We have a culture now, and we've only just met, right? So when we talk about creating culture, what we really mean is identifying the culture that we want to have, identifying what culture we have now, and figuring out how to transition between the two. So this is uh, AOL. If you've been following AOL much at all the last years, you know that AOL is bleeding talent. Um, and a lot of that talent is going to startups, or they're going to start their own companies, or you know those kinds of things. They're having a hard time attracting and keeping talent. And so what they did was they created this room that looks like it has a pretty great culture, right? So they added pool tables, uh, they did yoga mats, right? Like they cater sushi in, all the hipster startup -y kinds of things. But the thing is they're copying the wrong things. They're copying the environments that these people are attracted to, not the actual reason they're going there. Pool tables are great for fun, Right? Fun work environments are cool. I don't have any problem with that. We have a pool table back at DI. But culture is about an environment that um, fosters behavior around a shared set of principles. And the pool tables and yoga mats don't do that. So I'm going to show you this video. I'm Davey Brown, the Northcom Innovation Lab Manager. My name is Christopher Lab. We work on one week experiments. Somebody will have an idea and we'll find a way to figure out how to prove if the idea is going to work. And this week the Innovation Lab is going to be building an iPad app with customer feedback as we go through the week. We wanted to work in the store to make sure that we were getting customer feedback as we work so that we were never working on anything that wasn't valued by the customer and only doing things that are delivering value. So we'll be building a feature and testing it until we get to the point where we have something that's good enough so we can just leave and leave the iPad app behind and have this new thing that customers can use. This is the world's first flash build. It's a flash mob where a software team shows up, it builds an application in a 
surprise location. This is the Nordstrom Innovation Lab, and we're at the Flagship Store downtown Seattle. Right now, the team is just setting up their equipment to get started. We're going to build an iPad app that helps customers pick the best pair of sunglasses for them. We really don't know what the features are yet. We're going to use customer feedback as we go along throughout the day and the rest of the week in order to build the best thing. So the next thing we're going to do is a user story map. So we're going to sit here and together outline all the steps that a customer would take. And actually even beforehand, how they buy sunglasses. Like what are the different things that they might do? And how that process might change if we have this application. And we'll actually dig into what we have to build in order to support that process. So now that we've done a card mapping, we're going to do a paper prototype. And this is something that we commonly do in the animation lab. It's a great way to show what we'd like to do in a rough prototype that we can easily throw out, change, alter, based on feedback from the customers. We'll continue building individual paper slides. And our user experience specialist <coughs> will bring the prototype to a customer and say, OK, I have this app, and this is a paper version. I'd like you to kind of use it like you would normally use an app. And you can press things, interact with them, and then she'll change out the pages based on how the customer uses it. So it's a similar experience to the iPad, only an analog version. So it's day two, and we have our first working prototype of this app. And how it works is I take my first pair of sunglasses, put it on, picture, all right. And then I want to compare it to this other pair I've got right here. You saw them. Another picture. I can just hold these up like this and see which one I like better. Well, I found a kid having talking to people and doing yeah. paper prototypes. We've been coding, building an iPad. We take a stab at something. We look at paper prototypes that they put together. We might take one at a time. Usually, we come to the board and we grab the most important feature and we start implementing it. The really cool thing with this flash build is that we have actual build customers just today. We deliver four or five different separate features, and I deliver it. Swap the iPad itself. She'd go and talk to a customer, and ten minutes later, I had feedback from real customers about this thing that I delivered, and it changed how we did the next thing. It's been really, really great watching day to day what they've been doing, the team, to get all the feedback from the salespeople, the feedback the salespeople got from the customers, and it's a really interesting process to kind of come in on Tuesday. We had no idea what this would look like. There was an idea that somebody had to say people take a lot of pictures of themselves with sunglasses. It'd be cool if we could show them side by side to help them make the process better. And that was the idea. That was it. They came in, they had nothing built, and they've been building this literally on the spot throughout each day. And by now, we actually have an app, a functioning app that they can go through. It's very intuitive to help look at themselves and make the sunglass selection process easier, which is pretty cool to watch. So yesterday, the sunglass buyer at the North Shore came down to check out our progress, and she happened to put on polarized glasses and then held up the iPad in portrait view and was surprised that she couldn't see anything from black. We figured out that polarization of the iPad running up and down and the polarization of the glasses running vertical cancel each other out. You don't see anything. But if you turn the iPad to landscape, you see perfectly fine because of the polarization of the two items lined up. And it's okay. So it was pretty good find to be in the store. She just happened to put on polarized glasses. And so today, first thing we're going to do is switch it to a landscape design and then lock in the aspect ratio of the iPad. So customers and salespeople just naturally pick it up and use it in landscape and not try and go to portrait. Okay, so I'm going to show you what we've been working on the last five days. We've added quite a few features over the week. You can take a picture, multiple pictures of the customer, and then you can pull them up. Tap the first one, you can see it um, larger, and then tap the second, and do a side-by-side -side comparison of each class next to each other. We also added a feature where you can rename the picture, because we heard from salespeople, if a customer's trying on quite a lot of glasses, it's helpful to be able to know what order they were Take it in and also rename if you want with the brand or some distinguishing feature on the class. Another feature we added was the ability to zoom. You can zoom in and really get a good detailed look at the frame side by side. Also, to see one of the pictures larger if you want to just better view of one frame. You can flip the camera view as well. Face it forward so the salesperson can take a picture of it like this, or you can flip the camera so take the picture. Uh, yourself basically. And then at the end of it all, you have a button called New Customer, which just erases all of the images and allows the salesperson to start with a new customer. We're just trying to put the final touches on the app. Dell talks to a lot of users, and they said that when we went into the compare view, it was unclear where the pictures were coming from and which picture was which. So the animation here is trying to solve that problem, make it a little more clear what's going on. One of the challenges with software is when you've done it right. 
Yeah, I think the answer is really depends on how much time you have. At least the most important thing is that time. So this was time box to a week, and we did a week's worth of work, and it seems like what we have now is something that makes customers happy and addresses the main problems, and something that we can track we have metrics on. So we're going to call that a day. The application has developed so far, everything's finished, everything that we've asked for, and even all the roadblocks and glitches that we kind of stumbled across as we use the app during the week has been solved. I think that it's going to be really easy to be able to implement into our sale, and I think that we're going to find a lot of success with the application, whether it's via a selling tool for us, or if it goes public into a downloadable format, whatever happens, I think this is generally quite successful. I love that video because it um, it shows it, it shows the process that we do, right? It feels at first glance kind of extreme, right? Like we're set up inside Nordstrom in a department store. We're talking to customers all the time. But in fact, what they're doing is the same process we do. We just kind of elongate it because we don't have the convenience of this. They stumbled across this. is my friend Gary, by the way. Um, I'm sure many of your friends too. Um, and we stumbled across this. Or they stumbled across this because of the bureaucracy at Nordstrom. Right? Like anything that took more than a week or two weeks to do required processes and approvals. So they just said, screw it, let's just go do it in a week. And it turned out to be a really kind of cool experiment, I thought. So <clears throat> um, disruption. We have lots of small startup companies now that are making pretty big changes and, and disrupting larger companies. And I think the big reason for that, again, coming back to the main point here, is culture, right? You get those same, you get a small group of people who all believe the same things and they, they value the same principles and so you automatically get this great culture. And these bigger companies can't produce that culture. You can't just create it. You has to, or you can't just like manufacture that out of nothing. You have to have that. And so what you get is, um, all kinds of innovation and new ideas and enthusiasm and energy that the bigger companies lack. And so a couple examples of that, this being one of my favorites, Square is going absolutely <laughs> insane right now, right? Like, this is not all that unique of an idea. People have been talking about taking payments on cell phones since cell phones had screens we could take payments on, but it's a really difficult business to break into. And without the right culture, right, like, it's going to be maddening. If you, if you can't put up with all like the crap that the banks are going to put you through and all the, the, F, the regulations and stuff you have to be a part of and all the security stuff, without a culture that really believes in what the world looks like when this is done, you're not going to get it done. Jack Dorsey is an absolute machine, <laughs> the CEO. Um, this is something that they created. And so a lot of companies, in, like a lot of big companies, have these little apps that talk about like, Okay, who's available, who's on call, where's the map, you know, what's coming in for lunch. You know, they have like these kind of logistical tools, but this I think is culture at Square because this happened automatically. Nobody came, there was no project manager assigned to make this thing happen, right? It was self-organized and it was done because the company needed it and nobody questioned the fact that they were trying to make the company better. And so I just think that's awesome. Here's another one, Mint.com. Um, Mint disrupted a pretty big industry, Quicken, or QuickBooks. Uh, quick end, right? And um, so they realize that there's this whole new generation of younger people who don't know how to balance their checkbooks and are too lazy to balance their checkbooks because they have technology that's capable of doing these things, but there was no technology really doing it well. And so they realize the experience that you have, the feeling that people want to have about their money is they want to feel like they're in control, right? They want to feel good when the money is good and when the, when the expense line is going this way, right? And it's going negative, you want them to feel bad, but you want them to feel in control. And so they figured out how to give that control to a whole new generation of people that never had, um, that, that really never felt that control before. So they disrupted this whole kind of standard way of doing things. Aaron Patzer, the CEO of Mint, said this after they got acquired by uh, Intuit for $170 million, right? Is that actually, to their credit, Mint is doing very well at Intuit. But the corporate campus seems so quiet, a startup is overflowing with energy. The culture, right, like started to die the minute that they became part of Intuit. Another one, Kickstarter. So Kickstarter doesn't have like a big parent company that it's going after to, take it to, to attack, right? But it's going after angel investors and kind of the typical way of raising money to start some idea. And so they have really interesting ideas. They, one thing they have is they took all their doors off of their offices, right? Like you can't have a conversation in a conference room with the door closed. You can't have the CEO close his door and take a private call. Everything is out in the open. Everybody's accessible to everybody else. But I think it's kind of interesting. 
I'm not sure exactly how they do it all the time, but it's an interesting culture. <laughs> Squarespace has a similar idea. This marketing slogan on their site is actually, I think, more than a marketing slogan. It's the culture. It's what they exist to do. That's the change they want to see in the world. That's what they believe in, is creating everything you need to create an exceptional website and making it easy to do, 24-hour support and, you know, all this stuff. That's exactly what they do. Squarespace addresses that same kind of like open door policy, but by not assigning anybody a desk. You come in every day and you sit somewhere else, and they encourage you to do that because you, like through osmosis, you pick up on other conversations and stuff that's happening around the company that otherwise you'd have to like, you know, be watching, you know, SharePoint or something. So I'm on this nationwide speaking tour now. I wake up every morning with a keen sense of why I go to work, and that reason is because I want to make our world more intuitive. I'm very passionate about it. And uh, so we do a variety of things at DI, consulting being the majority of our revenue right now. Um, but we work with 15 to 20 companies a year, right? And 15 to 20 companies is a really slow way to change the world. And so I'm going out and speaking to all these different groups and people who work at companies and like, like Gaslight and other places that I visited today and will visit on my trip because I want to try to inspire some change in thinking about the culture that they have as their team and start to identify some ways that we can maybe empathize with their users a little better. So I am not a technology guy, uh, at least not originally. I started out when I was three years old. I came home from church. I reached my hands up to the piano, and I started trying to, like, just play notes and stuff. And my parents figured out that I was playing the hymns that had been played at church that day. I was very blessed to have a good ear. And uh, they said, we got to get this kid a teacher. And now, being 30 years old and giving lessons to neighborhood kids and stuff, I understand why they couldn't find one. I wouldn't have taken me. It's a three-year-old kid. Do you imagine? But something interesting happens when you play the piano for a really long time, right? When you start to learn a new piece of music, and it's too challenging for you, what you do is you break it down into really small pieces. You know, two measures here, then you do the next two measures, and you do the next two measures, and you practice them over and over, and then you start to piece them together. You have four measures, eight measures, 16 measures. And what happens at some point is that your fingers just learn what to do. Right, like muscle memory, like learning how to type. When you first start learning how to type in school, right, like you learn the home row and you have to reach your left pinky up to hit the Q key, right? And after time, you can start thinking about the words and not think so much about what your fingers are doing. And so what happens when you're playing the piano is that your fingers get on autopilot and your ears perk up and they start to listen to things more uh, carefully and they start to make recommendations to your hands as to what you can do to make better music. In fact, listening, listening to the music is the experience, right? The act of playing the piano is like, right, to get nerdy when you hear we're the integrators, we're the, the implementers, right, we're the engineers, the fingers. But the experience is listening to that music. You don't have to know how to create it in order to know how to experience it. In fact, in college, there's a whole study of music appreciation, which is understanding form and different styles of music, different techniques and different concerns that players have when they're creating music and that kind of stuff. Um, and you don't necessarily have to be able to create it to appreciate it. And I think of that experience, kind of an analogy there between us creating the software and not always paying attention. Like our, we're it's like we're playing the piano with our with hands over our ears, right? Like your daughter does when your when your dad plays the guitar, right? <laughs> so I when I went off to college, I actually went to go study music. This is not me, but I think it looks remarkably like me. <laughs> Um, I, I was a trombone player, so I played piano and organ, that was my primary instrument, but I played trombone in the band in the orchestra. And I had the problem that all creative people have, which is that over time I had developed a sense of what really good music was. I had developed a sense of taste. And your execution will never get to the level of, to satisfy your own taste. It's maddening. Right, so as you get as you get better as a player, your sense of taste gets better. And so you'll never ever be satisfied with yourself. Right, as a trombone player, I was picking up after 10, 15 years of playing the piano, I was now trying to pick up this trombone and play at the same level that I could play at the piano, and I never could do it. And I realized that my gift was not so much in executing, but in coordinating. That I was very good at coordinating and, and uh, inspiring others to create music that was up to my taste, even though I couldn't create it myself. And I think about user experience design that way. I think about that as kind of a coordination role, more than the person who sits down in the trenches drawing wireframes and stuff. It's the person who sits back and understands what the user's trying to do with all of this stuff and coordinate the team in a way that cares about that. So, and, and where the internet and our whole industry is going, right, is we're still really young. This thing is a long way to go. Technology is going to advance far beyond where it is now. We're still in kind of that muscle memory phase, right? Like our fingers are still trying to figure out how to hit everything just right. And at some point in the near future, I think that's going to change. And technology is going to become more accepted and more mainstream. 
and it's gonna it's gonna take over and we should need to be prepared to watch for the right things when that happens so you guys probably recognize this as waterfall right this is the process we go through when we write software hopefully not <laughs> um, and, and and even but even in agile software Right, the design phase still looks remarkably like this in a lot of companies. We, we're agile about these three pieces really well, develop, test, and deploy, and usually about define, but this thing for somehow gets lost in the mix. And so we have this time where we take the design and we throw it over the wall, and you know, the developers pick it up, and then they do their agile thing and they make it good. We need to include the design better in that, in that phase. And so this is what Jeff Gotthelf, who uh, invented this movement called the Lean UX movement, which is taking off now, this is his recommended process, which I think is pretty good. We'll get into that in more detail in a minute. So this is Jonathan Snook. I'm speaking alongside him in a couple, what, about a month here at Restbot Refresh in Cleveland. And I think he's, he you know, says this on 140 characters really well. Prototype, test, validate, deploy, repeat. So I want to tell you a little bit. Design is like a, is a, a culture is like a weird thing, right? That you can't prescribe <laughs> how to create a culture. Because every team is different. We started at a different place, and we're trying to go a different place. So there's no set of like rules and guidelines we can get through to get there. So that caveat is said. I want to show you a little bit about some of the things we've done and maybe it'll inspire some things for you. So one of the things we've done is we hire based on culture fits more than we hire based on skill fits. One of that, and so with that in mind, start with the end in mind. So what is the optimal experience for this thing we're trying to do? What, is, what would it look like if we did it exactly the right way? Who does it target? What effect does it have on the product and the outside? And what worldly change does it make if we do this thing the ideal way? We need to start by thinking about what the end's going to look like. Always consider the best design before deciding what to build. This is probably the thing we do better than anybody else I've ever met in our industry. I don't like to toot my own horn, but I think we do this really well. Is we consider, once we decide the direction we're going to go, we keep talking about it. And because there's not a whole lot of danger, there's not a whole lot of waste in having another two-hour discussion about the problem that you're, ha you're trying to solve. A lot of times what you find is after you make that decision point, you find something way simpler or way better because you, you kind of, like, it's like asking that five whys to get down to the main reason as to why something's happening. When you explore past that point, you start to find new things that you hadn't necessarily thought of before. We can't, but that aside, we can't always build the thing, right, that is best designed. There are constraints in there, time, budget, that kind of thing that we need to consider. But I think we should always at least consider what the best design could be if we had all the necessary resources. This is more for uh, people who do the hiring. But hire motivated people instead of trying to hire people with skills and motivate them. You can't take somebody who's not motivated and make them motivated. In fact, I love the way that um, Herb Gallagher, the CEO of Southwest, says this. We'll hire someone with less experience, less education, and less expertise than someone who has more of those things and has a rotten attitude because we can train people, we can teach people how to lead, we can teach people how to provide customer service, but we can't change their DNA. We actually just are going through this now. We uh, lost a developer whose um, girlfriend is going to Chicago to take a really good job, and he's going to Chicago with her, and we'll miss him dearly, and we needed to replace him. So we put a uh, thing out looking for a developer, and what we got was this guy who was not in software at all. He was a project manager in an agile company that was building bridges. He's a, he was a structural engineer. So he got Scrum, he got Agile, he understood the benefits, but he wasn't in, in like our specific um, industry. And so this guy was a great fit. He, he just, he got it, he was really motivated, he hated his current job, he really wanted to get into software, he was really motivated, and he had some developer skills, he'd been, been, he had been mentored by another developer, and we just thought this guy had a lot of promise, so we hired him. And he starts next Monday. So we will find out <laughs> how big a mistake this was or not. But I, I have a hunch this is going to be a really good fit because he is such a good uh, culture fit. And this kind of moves into the next one, which is don't compete for talent and definitely don't use a recruiter. <laughs> right? So it's really hard to get hired by our company. We're, we're a very small company, and culture is the number one thing. And any bad seed when you're only 10 people will ruin the whole thing. And we can't afford to spoil the whole thing. So we go through five interviews at least. <laughs> the last interview being dinner out with my wife and I, my partner and his wife, and the, the, um, the uh, prospect and their spouse. Right? And if at that point we've decided they're a good fit professionally, but we don't know how they're going to fit socially and interactively and that kind of stuff. And so my wife will get one of those feelings when somebody's now right. And 
So we like to go out and we all just kind of nod and then we make the job offer, right? But we want to get together and get to know them a little bit better. What? We. Yeah. Oh, he did a jump kick. He got. He was up at Applebee's. He literally got up and did like a kung fu like jump kick in the air, which I thought was awesome. Like this guy's motivated. I'm. I'm super excited about him. Handle bad situations better than other companies. So. Um, Shit happens, right? There's no avoiding it. No matter how happy we are and how what great culture we try to have at the office, something bad's going to have to happen. And um, so I think it's good to look at other companies who've had that same situation. We're not unique. And how did they handle it? And what can we do to handle that in a better way? So the only example I can really think of this right now is we had one time last year in 2012 where we asked our team to stay late. Um, we, we are usually very respectful of people's private time at home, and we want them to get out of the office and go spend time with their families. But we had one project where we had estimated badly, and the deadline was approaching, and we needed them to stay over. So I had the tough discussion with them. And our graphic designer, Brad, whose work was entirely done, he had nothing left to do, decided to stay with us. And um, we urged him to go home. We were, you know, the other Brad and Kevin and, and everybody was like, dude, go home. Right? Go be with your family. There's no reason for you to be here. We got this. And he said, no, I feel like I should be here. We fall as a team, you know, we succeed as a team and we fail as a team. And I never prompted that. I never told him that. And so that was one of the, one of the things to me that said, okay, we're do we got something right there. Another one, build things that other companies are too scared to approach. So I think one of the best ways to make people feel happy is to make them feel like they've accomplished something, especially when they've accomplished something somebody else couldn't do or was too afraid to try. This is scary. Right? Sometimes taking on something you don't exactly know how you're going to do if you're not big enough to handle it or whatever. Right? Like, but when you finally do pull that off, it feels awesome. And in fact, a couple wins on really good projects will outweigh several failures across that. So I mean, you may as well aim to try and do something big. And this is my last one. Policies are only for zero tolerance situations. This is a, a, almost a pet peeve of mine. But policies are easy to create and really difficult to enforce. And culture is really hard to create but you don't really have to enforce it. It polices itself. And so when we started, we had way too many policies. In fact, I heard this thing from Jason Fried. He was a TED Talk, and he, the title was Why Work Doesn't Happen at Work. And his point was that people tap each other on the shoulder too much. You know, getting into the zone is like REM sleep. When you get tapped in the shoulder and pulled out, you don't just fall right back to being in the zone. You have to kind of work your way back in. And so my partner Dave and I said, God, we are terrible about this. So what we're going to do is when you have your headphones on, you're not allowed to tap the other person on the shoulder. We set a policy, right? And so what happened over time, we respected it for like a couple days, right? And it was all good. And Dave would come in and tap me on the shoulder and I'd be like, hey, you know, just a friendly reminder, we're not going to do this anymore, right? And what happened was he would start to feel bad about doing it. And I felt bad about kind of, you know, telling him about it. So we stopped. And now the policy isn't enforced anymore. We just keep interrupting each other. And so we tried this like four times. Every time I pick up rework and flip through the book again, I'd see that chapter and be like, ah, we still suck at this. So we went through this hiring phase a couple years ago, about a year and a half ago, and this was getting worse. Like, it wasn't just Dave and I tapping each other on the shoulder now. We had 10 people or eight people at the time that were tapping each other on the shoulder. It was becoming a real problem. So I said, I went to this conference in October of last year called the Business of Software Conference. And one of the things they talked about was this kind of create a culture, not a policy thing. So I said, oh, interesting. So what we did is I went on Basecamp. I didn't talk to the company about this at all. I just went on Basecamp, and I posted this message that said, when you really got to get something done, where do you go? And so what the point of this was to try and get the team to come through and say, I go to my basement, I turn all the lights off, and I do this thing. Or I go to a coffee shop, right, and I work there. Or I just put my headphones on, and I just ignore anybody, anything flying at me or whatever. And I wanted the rest of the team to realize what other people looked like when we were in the zone so they would recognize it before they tapped them on the shoulder. And it stopped just like that. And it's never been a problem since. And to me, that was like, huh, oh my god. So there are appropriate times for policies, right? Sexual harassment, you have to put a policy in place, right? Um, but generally speaking, if you can create the right culture, the policies don't matter as much. This is one of my heroes. His name is Don Norman. He's kind of the founder of our industry. He coined the term user experience at Apple in 1995. And in one of his books, he tells the story of driving a mountain road in his Porsche. So he's you know, curving up and down. He's got his wife in the, in the passenger seat next to him, and he's going up and on the roads. He's downshifting appropriately and flying around the terms. You're like cliffs on the sides, right? And he realizes that his wife is like, right? Like, <laughs> braced for death. 
And um, he says, it's all right, honey. I got this. I'm in complete control. But if you want, you know, I'll slow down. I'm a good husband. So he slows down. Fast forward a couple years. He's got a new car. He's driving the same mountain road when his car senses that it's scared. And it starts beeping at him. And the seat starts to vibrate because he's getting too close to one of the shoulders of the road and all kinds of stuff. And he says, whoa, and he hits the brakes. So the question is, why does he trust his car more than he trusts his wife? And I would really encourage you to read that book because the answer to that is really fascinating. Unfortunately, I can't sum it all up as well as he does. But at Apple at the time, when he started talking about user experience, it was a very different Apple than it is now, right? Like, there was no Steve Jobs, for one. He was gone. The stock price was $10.13. Their market cap was $5 billion, which is the last two weeks of revenue. So they're a very different company. The iPod was nothing, right? In fact, this is what um, System 7.5 looked like that year when it came out, which is still kind of revolutionary back then, but now we kind of chuckle at it, right? But Don was not a technology guy either. He was a cognitive psychologist. He just happened to make his career in technology. He wrote a book, one of my favorite books in, in, my, in the industry of all time, called The Design of Everyday Things, which if you've ever read, the first chapter is, why, was, is about why his publisher made him change the title of the book. Because the original title was The Psychopathology of Everyday Things. <laughs> And it was in the psychology section, and they said, no, we need to put this in the design section, and you need to call it the design of everyday things. And he reluctantly relied. And, of course, it's not one of the best-selling books in our industry, but he's still a little, uh, <laughs> look it up. It's pretty funny. Great book. So Peter Merholtz, who runs Adaptive Path, this was an email from Don to Peter Merholtz. I invented the term user experience because I thought human interface and usability were too narrow. I wanted to cover all aspects of the person's experience with the system, including industrial design, graphics, the interface, the physical interaction, and the manual. So he goes on later to say, design based on the needs of the user, leaving aside what deems secondary, like aesthetics. So when he talks about design, he's not talking about what most of us think of as design. No, it's not graphic design. It's not wireframes. It's deeper than that. And he came up with these seven stages of action, which if you look at them carefully, look a lot like Agile. So we form the goal, we form the intention, which is, you know, what are we going to do about this goal that we want to create? Specify an action, which now we're getting in the nitty-gritty. We're writing cards, right? Executing the action, perceiving the world. Executing the action is them actually playing with the app, right? Giving it to the user. Then we perceive how the world has changed, interpret what that means to the goal we had, evaluate the outcome, and then when it's not right, we do it again, all again, right? We do this over and over and over. It's iterative software development. you also notice none of this is CSS3 gradients or Photoshop filters or any of that stuff. So Peter Merholtz, again, CEO of Adaptive Path at the time, was in order for UX to achieve its potential, we need to reframe it as a possession, as a profession. <laughs> possession. And so I think a great way to illustrate this is Dan Saffer in his book, Designing for Interaction. This is how he maps the skill sets in user experience design, right? And I fit a lot of these. I'm a visual designer. I may not be as good as some people, but I can, I can hold my own okay. I do some human-computer interaction. Industrial design, not so much. Content, information architecture, I do a lot of architecture. Yeah, interaction design being my really big forte. So these are all the skills related in user experience design. But when you overlay it like this, what you see are all the things we miss by only focusing on our skills. And the yellow parts are the things that the culture finds that just having a team of uh, skills-based people will never find. So when I think about our process for developing software, I think about it like this. Starting on the left, moving toward the right. So it starts with a hint of an idea, right? Like we have this goal, this change we want to see, but we really don't know what it looks like. And we progress over time through iterations, design iterations, development iterations, the whole thing, until we get to a pretty well-defined vision for what this product looks like. So going back here to Jeff Cotthealth's, Got Health is a UX process from the Lean UX movement that he's trying to start. I think this is good. Concept, prototype, test internally, test externally, learn from user behavior, and then iterate. Do it all over again, being these two where usability testing happens right when you're talking to people. So in the concept phase, we're talking to users, right? Like this is where we're doing personas and mental models and getting to understand the domain of the problem we're solving. This is like the first step we take on a really long journey where it, we can always change direction as we start moving, but the first step kind of sets the direction that we're going. If we step this way and we end up going that way, right, like we're going to stumble a lot trying to get there. So it's, this is the phase where we kind of figure out which direction are we going to go in. 
the second phase here, prototype. This is where two things, right? Creative people figure out the work they're doing while they're doing it. It's not always defined really well up front. So this is the phase where designers get to kind of play with stuff and figure things out. The other thing they're doing is also creating documents and deliverables that we'll use in the next couple steps where we are validating with customers. Then we take it internally to the team. This is the culture step, right? Because if you don't have a good culture to validate internally, this will be an abysmal failure. You have to have a team that is okay pushing back at you and telling you, no, this is the change you're trying to make and you're going in this direction and these two things don't line up and I don't, I don't think that's good. So good culture there is key. Testing externally solves two problems. The obvious problem being, is this thing I'm designing right? right? Is, this, is it solving the problem where you think we're going to solve and we're validating with the people who will actually use that software? And so that's good. But the other thing it's confirming is that our team culture is right, right? Because we should be hearing fairly consistent things between these two steps. And if you don't, there's a little bit of a smell there to try and make that better. Learn from user behavior. This is really hard. This is probably what the user, when we talk about like user experience designers having a really good gut feel for how design works or what their intuition is, that's this. Because users tell us things, but they don't always tell us what they really mean. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But learning how to interpret that feedback is really important. And then the last one, probably the most important of all of them, is do it all again. And do it over and over and over and over and over until the feedback is consistent. So I'll give you a little bit of an example of this. I'm going back to the story I told you at the beginning about breaking into the, uh, into the military place. This is the Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center. And the guy Mark I had met makes his living as a suicide cleanup guy. Not such a good job. So this is a whole industry I have no idea about. And my job now is to come in and empathize with these people. It's pretty depressing. So I showed up at the Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center, and I did every job they would have me do, right? Here's Mark walking down the hallway, and roughly what happens, I'm standing in a shipping center, and all, all the way down the end of this long manufacturing hallway, dirty blood comes in that end, dirty blood being straight out of somebody's arm. We assume it's dirty until we test it and think otherwise. It works its way through about 10 processes until it gets to this distribution center where it goes out to hospitals and back into people's arms. Hopefully different people, but not always. Sometimes the same people who donate get the same blood back. So I did everything I could. I stocked blood in coolers. I spun blood in centrifuges. I don't know if you know this. When you donate blood, it takes your blood and creates 22 different products out of it that they sell. Really kind of fun. I spun in centrifuges. I did everything they would let me do. This is kind of like the, the scanning area where you go through and test to make sure no one has syphilis. Um, the only job they wouldn't let me do was poke somebody with a needle. I'm OK with that. Um, and then this is that shipping center at the end, the very end of the process. And this is where I spent most of my time was with this people. This lady back here named Joy, right here. And Joy's job was to make sure that when an important order came in, that it got taken care of quickly. So you can imagine a lot of the blood that goes out to customer sites is routine, right? Like it's just they're changing inventory from one hospital to another. Stuff expires. They're replenishing stocks. But pretty regularly, you get what's called a stat order, which is exactly what you think of from being on TV, right? Is oh my god, someone needs blood and we don't have it and get it to me now. And so this is how they manage that process with a whiteboard. And so what happens to walk you through this process again? I'm, I'm now Joy, right? I'm at this blood center and I'm answering the phone and this nurse is yelling at me saying, I've got this patient with this blood type, needs this kind of screening, I need this much blood and I need it stat. So I said, hang on, talk to Joy. I give the phone to Joy, right? And, and so Joy what she does is she takes it down, she writes all this information down, she gets a printout from the, from the uh, ordering software that comes along a few minutes later, and she flips this light switch. And that light switch turns red light bulbs on and off down that whole hallway that we just went down a minute ago. This whole highway. There's red light switches that go off. And that signals, everybody stop what the hell you're doing, come out in the hallway, Joy is going to come tell us how to organize around this stat order. So what she's doing is inducing panic. Right? She is now running up and down the hallway, barking orders at people. And we know that when we're under panic, we don't really do our best work. So this is a process that needed to change. So here's what we did. Here's the printout that comes in a few minutes later. We decided to build software that integrates with the hospital's medical record system instead of picking up the phone and calling, or faxing, in this case, is what happened. And um, so they say, I've got this patient needs blood, needs a stat. They hit the button, and it immediately pops up on everybody's computer in the basement. Everybody does their little part of the process, meets at the logistics center, and just ships it out. This whole process needs to happen in 20 minutes. So it's quick. And in fact, when I started there, they missed over 70% of them. 
So this is FDA approval stuff. This is bad. You don't miss these things. You big fines. So what we decided to do, I took this printout, and I took this, and I talked to people for hours about it, two hours. Each of the individual people, I sat in a conference room, and I just showed them this stuff. And I said, what are you looking at? What's important? What's the big things? You know, I'm going to redesign this thing, and I want to know a little bit more about it. And they told me all this stuff. And what they didn't tell me is exactly what I needed to know, which is what's drawn here, the little sketches, right? Circling this thing, whatever this meant, and these little tick marks. Told me almost everything I needed to know, so we drew this. After a few iterations, right, like we sketched it out, printed it out, threw it up, drew it in Omnigraph, we'll print it out, took it down there. Not good enough, tried again, missing this piece of information. We did it a whole bunch of times, and we came out with this thing at the end. I'm blurring, obviously, because this is a real border. Um, and you notice things like stat. Right? Which, where is that on here? <laughs> it's, it's printer friendly, page one of one. Right? But stat is, happens when they circle the order number. So the circle order number means stat. Sure. So I put stat. Right? Can't miss it. And one of the things we found from this is that they would stack these things, you know, kind of like you would think at a desk where you, each order is like offset like an inch from the other. You can't see the circle number. So you don't know which ones are stat. But this way, Boom, stat. You can see it. So that's an example. I wish I could show you a whole lot more of this blood project. Unfortunately, there's lots of sensitive information and stuff that I can't divulge. But this project was really, um, really touching to me. Again, that guy, Mark, who did suicide cleanups, quit his job because he wanted to be on the life side of blood instead of the death side of blood. And so going out, I spent a long time in the car. I spent almost an entire, car, an entire day in the car with this guy, Mark and looking at the kinds of things he does and how he goes out and um, really saves people's lives. It was very emotional for me. So I have one of these little magnet things on my, on my door out when I go out into the garage. So I told my wife that it's when I come home from work, I'll set this, and that way you know what mood I'm in, right? You put the little circle around it, and you know what mood I'm in that day and know what to expect. It's not really true. In fact, she saw my presentation about this a couple weeks ago, and I'm in trouble. But what this, <laughs> what this means to me is a reminder when I leave to go to work that I have to care about how my users feel, not what they think. And so these are all different kinds of feelings that our users are feeling every single day. So there are many parts of our brain. I'm going to go a little medical nerdy on you for a minute, but it's important. Um, there are many parts of our brain. The two main parts responsible for our experience are our limbic system, which is our subconscious brain. It's responsible for breathing, other subconscious activities, as well as feelings and uh, emotions, that kind of stuff. But no rational thought, no language, no conscious behavior at all. Then we have our neocortex, which is the opposite of that. It's our, it's our uh, conscious brain. And so it's responsible for thinking, rationalizing, observing, and, under and trying to describe things that we see, right? So when we say we feel bad, we're talking to our limbic system. And when we're explaining why we feel bad, it's our neocortex observing the limbic system and explaining why. And these two things disconnect a lot. So I asked my friend, hey, Fred, why did you marry your wife? And she goes, because you're smart and funny. Well, there's lots of smart and funny women, Fred. Why did you, hire, why did you marry this girl? And he goes, I don't know. She just felt right. And we get what he means, but there's no real good way to explain that. And in fact, sometimes this, this kind of leaks out by saying things that don't really make sense, but yet we get, like, she completes me the hell? I don't know what that means, but we know what that means, right? <laughs> so it's really common during usability studies to hear something like, I'm frustrated by this thing, or I wish this thing did this, or you're missing this feature, or something like that, right? And what they're telling you is, I feel frustrated, and I want you to figure out why. So you need to be careful not to listen to what they tell you, but what the feeling that they're telling you about. In fact, I find a lot when I talk to users, how does this make you feel instead of what do you think about this? is a really great way to phrase that question. You get very different answers. Along this line, this is one of my favorite Simpsons episodes ever, which is, um, I forget what the guy's name is. He finds out, Homer finds out that he's got, what? Herb, yeah. He finds out he's got this brother who runs the Powell Auto Group in Detroit. And the, the automotive company is, is failing, having trouble coming up with good design. And so they say, you're the ideal American. Well, let you design it, right? <laughs> And so you come up with what you see here. It's got like nine cup holders and blaring, and you've got these little dome things, right? And so he brings this design back, and it costs $82,000. And the car company goes bankrupt. And this would be really funny if it didn't happen every day. Right? It happens every day. That's why we're here, is to stop that from happening. So UX is about our culture. 
and creating a culture that understands the feelings that our customers have. And it's our responsibility as designers, as developers, as product owners, as marketers, as customer support people to understand what that unified front, how we want our customers to feel, is communicated well. And so I think it's, I think it's all of our job. And I think we all need to care. And to the extent we don't care, we're failing our customers. So here's some takeaways. What if we talk about our user feelings at stand-ups? Not just, here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm going to do today, but here's what, how I want our customers to feel about the thing that I'm creating. What if we're explicit about feelings in our user stories? We can't automatically execute those, right? Cucumber didn't know how to do that yet. <laughs> what if we use the end of every sprint as an opportunity to talk about, OK, I went and talked to our users, right? And this is how they're feeling, and we need to address that for this reason or another. And what if we were really good about sharing the results of these user sessions with the rest of our team? So this new world that I see, this new bliss, right, is right at our fingertips. It feels kind of like, oh, this is kind of like highfalutin, you know, blue sky crap. No, it's, it's like right here. We have all the skills. We have all the people. We have the necessary things to accomplish this. We just have to reach out and care about it and do it. And so that's my mission on this trip is to figure out how to do that. And with that said, thank you very much. So I... Thank you. If anybody has specific questions, I would love to take questions. Again, this being one of those things that can't really be prescribed. Oftentimes, you can find some really interesting things in the Q&A session with specific examples. But that's up to you guys. Yeah? I work uh, by myself, sometimes with my son, doing iOS stuff. And uh, right now, I'm working on an app for a local company somewhere down the road here. And uh, they're new to this whole process. You know, I'm working with a marketing partner. You know, the, so I'm kind of leading them slowly down, you know, the semi-agile path. And, yeah. You know, I'm really every, you know, every time we we meet, every time we review the sprint, and all that kind of stuff. It's like I really need to talk to some real users, you know, because we just get started. We only done this a couple of rounds now. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure how to convince them that that's important. <laughs> how know? to convince them that users are important? Well, I mean, no, I mean they, they know that it's important, but that uh, I, I well actually this time I don't. I, Without beating them on the head. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I came across snarky. Yeah, I was no, asking no, seriously. No, yeah. I mean, they, because they're trying to, you know, they have, uh, it's a little bit backwards. You know, their their CEO is enamored with, you know, apps, and they want their, it's a, um, well, pharmaceutical sales kind of company, right? Okay. They want to tie in with their customers. So, you know, they're, they want something. <coughs> right. You know, it's that convey kind of thing. And, it, and it's actually a pretty good idea. But, uh, I think they're talking to a couple of guys that would actually use the app that work in the company, and I'm trying to encourage them. I really need to talk to them. You know, I need to get involved with them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, they're kind of, the two guys that I am interacting with are really busy and they're hard to get a hold of. So it's not really, you know, the development's going fine, but as far as interaction, you know, I'm just looking for some vague advice. So, so it's it's hard to get the feedback from users because their schedules don't allow it. Well, the, or, their schedules don't allow it, and so the you know my our. Or two or three weeks sprints turn into five or six weeks, just you know, a whole bit, right? You know, so the whole project stretches out. Yeah. You know, my workload doesn't stretch. Well, my workload doesn't increase; just stretches out. Right. And and really to get to the next level of usefulness for this app, so you know, what it does, it does fine. That's the prototype we have right now. But I really need to encourage them that uh, we're not going to really get to the next level until they, you know, basically they need to commit some of their employees that who would be real users because you know it's a certain medical condition that it deals with you know yeah. and uh, they need to commit to kind of giving me some time with some of their people and uh, do they do they not want to charge like they don't want you to charge them for that time what's, what's the no it's, it's just uh, I just you know I, I guess I'm trying to do a sales job I mean this is important <laughs> you know, yeah they don't view it as important right. as I do right so one convince them that it's important it's not that they don't want to it's just to them, it's just, oh yeah, we need to do that. Yeah. So I, I I approach it just as the way I do wireframing, yeah. right? So I take something that they already understand and know we have to do, which is draw a wireframe. And what they picture is take a pencil, draw a wireframe. Right? And there's much more into that. I just roll <coughs> talking to users into drawing wireframes. <coughs> just say, I mean, so just say flat out, you know, I need to. I, I got this thing I'm drawing. I want to see if other people get it. I mean, that's what I really. Need. That's all I really want. And I, I've yeah. told them that almost as words. So. <laughs> And sometimes this is difficult. We're doing a project for Microsoft, building a call center app for them. And the person I need to talk to is inside a call season, like a supervisor on a very busy call floor at Microsoft. I can't. If I went to her thing, or to her call center, I still couldn't get 15 minutes with her. So that's what this product is, <laughs> right? Oh, okay. now, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not here to pit myself too much, but um, 
that's what that product is. So it's an automated facilitator for gathering feedback for people you can't actually sit down face to face with. So it's for gathering long form feedback about how people are feeling and then sharing that across the team. Um, in terms of the pushback you get from people, sometimes I find it necessary. In this case, I don't know if it would work because um, the, the small. Yeah. And, 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 and the user is internal, right? They work for the company that you're. Well, I mean, they're, because of the nature of their, what they sell, you know, a lot of their real users are actually work for the company because it's, you know, one of those mixtures. So, so they have legitimate users of this product. They, they want to go out to their other customers that are internal to their company. So they, they have an easy source for real users. I just need to get to them somehow. Yeah, my, my, Sometimes that's really difficult. My friend Susie, I was consulting with a, a company that made social networks for surgeons. Mm -hmm. And surgeons are very busy people with high billable rates, right? Like they're difficult people to nail down. <laughs> but the fact, if you can actually get to them, most of them are genuine, pretty nice guys. So the approach that they took was they went to conferences <coughs> where they were going to show off the app to the company and try and build the network. And what they did was they realized that, hey, this CEO goes over here and grabs coffee every morning. Or this surgeon over here goes and does this thing. And Susie just went out and said, hey, I know you're a busy guy. I don't want a whole lot of your time, but this thing I'm building is really going to benefit you a lot, and I'd really like 10 minutes of feedback from it. And they're happy to give it to you. you got to stalk them. Well, I don't even know the names yet. They talk to them. I said, can I take these guys out to lunch? That's a good idea. I just need to do that. I'll send them email. You have to be creative. So start taking pictures. No, I want to show them where we are because you know I have this vague sense that this is going the right direction. So far, based on what they, but I don't know that yes, I haven't talked to the user yet. I really, really need. A lot, a lot of times, um, people hear user feedback sessions and they think something more formal, like a focus group, and we got to we got to give everybody an Amazon gift card when yeah. they show up, right? And it's like, no, that's that's not what I'm talking about, right? I just I just need to go casually, go have a coffee with somebody and show them some I, stuff. Yeah, basically, I just I need a, a good approach to kind of John, the guy I work with, say, listen, I need to talk to these people. Give me their names, and I'll see if I can take them out to lunch or something. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think that's when, when you're talking about um, cultures and users, you're talking about the group that's making the apps, but users, it's a whole other thing. With a lot of people, it's sort of the bring me a rock scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, that's that's almost from cool days, I don't know. I don't know the bring me a rock cartoons for programmers where the guy says, bring me a rock, and the programmer goes off and brings back a rock, and they go, oh, not that rock. <laughs> and then it, it iterates. <laughs> you have any substance criteria? Well, <laughs> right, it goes on and on. Read my mind. But uh, a lot of people out there in app land using apps, bosses, they just want you to bring them the shiny app, and they don't necessarily want to get touchy feely about all that. They just want it, and of course, that's where all the this gap is: is is the people paying for it aren't the same ones using it, and somehow getting them all together. Yeah, it, is the challenge. It can be challenging. So I, when we do the the persona research at the very at the very beginning, which is like formally identifying who our customers are and making up, we usually give them a fictional name and a fictional picture. But otherwise, like there's a real bio and quotes and motivations and stuff that we put on this persona, and those things have to be based on real people. We can't just invent those based off of our experience working with those kinds of people. They have to be interviews with real people. So the question I always ask when I go talk to somebody about a persona is. Can I come back to you in a few weeks when we have some more sketches and show you that? And they always say yes. Another thought on your your suggestion to you know just email him and say, give me the names of these people. One reason for the pushback might just be since he doesn't care about it as much, he sees it as more work for him. So the less they can, the less that look, can, I think he cares. He's just way too busy. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Not caring is same effect. Would he be mad if you just did it? Pardon? Would he be mad if you just did it? Well, I don't. I mean, other than emailing. Walking into their office down the street and saying, "Who are you? Who's in here working with John?" <laughs> I mean, it might not know what I'm known to do much worse. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Again, but we're stalking surgeons at conferences, right? So I've done much worse. Well, I'll, I'll try it. I mean, John, he's, he's very cooperative when I can get his attention. It's just getting easy. There's one really easy way to find pharmaceutical salespeople: is to go sit in an office waiting room, you know, a doctor's office waiting room. They show up all the time. Yeah. I'm thinking for a truly disruptive application, 
you're actually creating a totally new world mm -hmm. for the user. Yeah. And so you know, oftentimes you go to users and you say, what do you want? How do you feel? They're trying to solve their current problem as compared to, do you ever get in this problem of trying to create, you know, you know, it's going to be you're, the way that you work is going to be totally different. Yeah, and, and how all do you the get, time. How do you get the user into your new reality as compared to just telling you? Yeah, you know, I used to work for General Motors, and um, and uh, they had a statement. One of, I talked to this plant manager one day. And he said, "You know, we realized we were doing a bad job, and so we decided we needed automation. So we automated. And now we find we're doing a bad job twice as fast." Yeah. <laughs> And so you know, so how do you get the user into into a new world? The new world you're trying to so, create. It, it's fine, but you don't even know what the new world is either. Exactly right? right. We figure it out as we're doing it. Right. That's the design stuff. Yeah. Um, that's the distinction between what our users tell us they want and what they really want, or what they're right. really feeling. Being able to interpret that. Um, a Hang on, Joe. A, a designer having doing this a whole bunch, right, will gain a sense of intuition about different things we can try and. I think listening to that to some degree is good. We're we're faltering with this. We're not faltering actually. I think we're doing this quite well at that call center project at Microsoft. I was telling you about. So the the project runs all these reports about analytics about their call center every day or week, and they run it in crystal reports, right? Because they built it 12 years ago, and, and this is what they have. Crystal reports is the wrong way to do this. So when they came to us, they said we want we want you to rebuild the reports using HTML5 and build this you know, thin JavaScript client that serves these reports and we get them really fast because now they take 30 minutes to run and we need them in like five seconds. So when we went in and started doing that and started talking to people, we realized they don't really need the report this way. They don't need the report this way. What they need is access to the data in a way they can kind of drill down into it and explore and find things more than they need a printable PDF like thing of a report. And it's very much the thing you're talking about because if you look at the, the call center industry, what they run are reports. They just migrated from crystal reports to PDFs, right? Or printable, or, or websites with printable style sheets. And we wanted to do something, I guess, much more innovative than that. And we've, the, the hardest part is on that has been um, explaining why we made the change that we made to users because you, you give some anxiety when you take their comfort zone away from them and put something else new. And we just, you know, our, our leader there at this company said, we're doing this. Like this is the direction we're going. You guys are going the right way. So just tell the customer we're doing this and get feedback about it. Right? Like we can send you some authority. We're not asking you if you think this is a good idea. We are going to do this. So tell us what's wrong with it, so we can fix the things that are wrong with it and go forward. And so there's some stressful conversations with people on phones and things like that that happen occasionally. Um, the really, the really frightening one to us on this was they had these old reports that, again took 30 to 40 minutes to run, and we went to the people and we said. Here's our new version. They take five seconds to run. What do you think? We love it. And across the board, everybody said, we love it. Nothing wrong with it. Please ship it. We want it now. And I'm thinking, they didn't push back on this at all. We completely ripped out this core piece of their system, and we replaced it with something dramatically different and better, right, because we built it. And they didn't, they, they didn't weren't scared at all. And so we had to kind of poke them. And we started putting things in the design. That I had to, we, Brad and I did it. I don't even know if you know this. We started putting things in the designs that were just plain wrong. Right, just to encourage the the discussion to start, you know, we show stats that didn't make any sense along inside other stats and tables to see if they would push back against it, and they never did. And of course, what we found out was that they don't use the old reports; they've just been trained not to. They take forty five minutes to run. Our boss runs them, and you know, he never looks at them. So any change is good change. So we, we've we've solved that a little bit by saying, okay, you don't run them. Here's what we'd have. What would you have in an ideal world? And we started getting some feedback from them that night. Anyway, yeah, you had some thoughts, Joe. I had a thought of both the concept of disruptive apps because I'm building in my, my spare time. You know how that is. Um, I'm kind of trying to work on a Mac app for designers, and it's it's that kind of thing where it's it's a way that they don't all work, but I think that I think that would be really great. For them. And so I've, I've I've thought about that quite a bit, and um, I think part of when you're building something disruptive, you're building it because you have you have some vision in your head of a better way to do something, right? And and so I think I think you have to be a little bit comfortable with um, okay I'm going to try to build this thing as quickly as I possibly can to get something working and then sit in front of somebody and watch them use it and like Josh was saying don't don't necessarily listen to what they say they want but listen to what their feelings are because you know you've got you you're hoping hopefully you're going to have thousands of other users who um, 
who are going to need stuff too and you need to kind of balance their needs. Um, you know, it's still a big juggling act, but. Um, part, part of that problem has been solved by this lean startup movement that's going on too, which is very much about having some innovative new idea, something that's never been done before, and validating that with users. Like, I wonder if you could kind of, I've never thought about this before, I wonder if you could kind of spin that same model into our feedback question. Sometimes you just run into back to culture again. Yeah. We can walk into a culture where some of this stuff is, isn't going to fly as well as many of the folks who want to talk. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, one thing I've tried to do is find the people that it does resonate with and work with them and tell them that, you know, let it just be as that one. We were just talking with a company earlier today that does a lot of work with P&G. And we were trying to explain this concept 21 to years there. So. Yeah, we're trying to explain this concept to them, and you know the response to us? Good luck. <laughs> you know, no, right. And, and so you 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 learn who the folks are that are going to be responsive, and and you start to work with them because otherwise you can get your head against the wall. In fact, they can sabotage. Not not part of P and G, but in any environment, if, if the culture isn't right. Willing to accept it, you know, they may have some just sabotage. Ways. The worst case, you walk away, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But are the customers right? So we're right at an hour, Bill. Yeah. Love to keep the conversation <laughs> socially, but I don't, I don't as much time as you want. That's fine. I don't, I don't want to keep going. Yeah. All right. We'll do one. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is a left field thing or not, but it, there's another uh, meetup that I signed up for not being a savvy design person called design thinking is that kind of in your uh, radar it's is it a local one here yeah but it's a, apparently it's a um, a meme that's been out there for about 10 years and it it it, it ranges from community organizing to industrial design it's, it's like some yeah Buzzword that I wasn't, and apparently a bunch of other web designers also joined the meetup, and they go, "Yeah, I want to work about this." And I'm looking at it and going, "Oh no, this it's is something in California right now." Yeah, it's an idea thing. I've heard it around some other companies. Idea being one of them. It's like yeah. PMG locally. Okay. I I didn't know there were specific like meetups. But but if you, <laughs> if you spent five minutes looking at it. You yeah, it's I'm, really about. I'm getting it's really a feeling. Are those the people that need to hear this? Mm. Um, you may actually be working in parallel on similar right. ideas. I, yeah, I, I, to a certain extent that's true, but it's really about observing people and what they how they do it. That's a big part. Yeah, I have to dig more into that. I'm familiar with the term. I didn't know there were specific meetings. I don't think there's a documentary on it. There's a documentary on it. There's a documentary on it. Because I'm thinking it would be the problem. Uh-huh. Oh, there's lots of material. Take it down there. I'm not sure. I'm good enough. Well, so thank you very much for coming out. If you were interested in following the rest of my tour over there, so you can follow me on Twitter. Or the company the company website's there on the bottom. Or this is our new product. It's going on in beta. We need feedback from our user too, right? So I would love if anybody who's interested would sign up for that. I'm not going to tell you. I looked at the web page while I was sitting here for yeah. that refocus. Yeah. It's not clear to me what the product and the beta is. Right. It's a customer analysis of website design or something? Um, yeah, so it's the, the website's not real clear because the website doesn't have much content on it. Um, it does have a fantastic 404 page. <laughs> and like all good designs, I show it to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get sued. By you. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, the idea of the product is that some people are are difficult, right, to get in front of, and so it's it, if you take a little piece of JavaScript, right, like a Google Analytics code, you install it in your production code, and it sits there dormant until someone gets invited to participate in some kind of like a questionnaire. So you can go in and set up a bunch of questions, and when you ask someone a question like, NewYorkTimes.com, how much does it cost for an iPad subscription? It'll pop, it'll pop up this little thing, ask you the question, and then you can go through and answer the, uh, go through and navigate the site. It records all the things you're doing, scrolling here, clicking here, searching for this, 
and then at the end asks for long form feedback about that experience. Were you, what was the answer you came up with? How confident are you that it was right? What can we do to improve the experience? How are you feeling about this? You know, stuff. Like, that's the idea of that. You have a place there where you can put in your email and mm -hmm. sign up for the beta. What kind of people are you trying to get to put their email in there? So we think we think marketers are going to see a lot of value out of this. We think of people like us, right? Like designers are going to see a lot of value out of this. Um, and I, I would hope that developers would care about this. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of validation on that yet, but that's the change I'm trying to make, right? Um, I, I would like for whoever does that to be able to take that information and share it with the team in some other way. So invite other people in to see the feedback from customers if they aren't initiating those kind of user tests. Anyway. But I think I think people who are doing marketing for doing things like uh, conversion tracking and stuff like that, where you might do A-B testing. Otherwise, this could be another tool that works alongside with those. Cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate right. it. Thanks, Josh.